Hi, I'm Julie McCullough here today with Barry Sheck, DNA expert, uh, attorney, and co-founder of The Innocence Project. Welcome, Mr. Sheck. Thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure, Julie. All right. So why don't we start out with you telling us a little bit about The Innocence Project, what it is, how it all started, and what the project aims to accomplish. Well, the project uh, formally uh, came into existence in 1992 as a clinical program at Cardozo Law School where I've been teaching for now close to 35 years. And uh, we, uh, my colleague Peter Neufeld and I, were, uh, had some expertise in uh, DNA testing. And we realized from the beginning that DNA testing had the potential uh, to exonerate a lot of people who had been wrongly convicted and to identify the people who really committed the crimes. Um, we also realized from the beginning that as we exonerated more and more people who are innocent, that we could shine a light on other causes of wrongful convictions in the criminal justice system. And those included certainly eyewitness misidentification, false confessions, uh, uh, invalid uh, or even fraudulent forensic science, uh, the uh, jailhouse snitch testimony, uh, prosecutorial police misconduct, uh, inadequate lawyers, incompetent lawyers, uh, and of course the uh, intractable problem that pervades this whole system, race. And so we formed the Innocence Project not just to exonerate the innocent, identify those who really committed the crimes, but also to try to reform the criminal justice system. What do you think is the most significant way that the Innocence Project has helped to improve DNA testing? Well, I, I think that, you know, really a lot of the litigation that we engaged in over the years um, set standards for the use of uh, uh, DNA evidence. And it's not just DNA evidence. Right now we're really in an extremely important moment in the development of forensic science. The only forensic science assay that has really been validated scientifically is DNA. And then when you looked at things uh, like even fingerprints or what they call ballistics, looking at tool marks on bullets or microscopic hair comparison, bite mark evidence, a whole group of forensic assays, mm -hmm. um, uh, they said, you know, they haven't been validated scientifically. Um, so this has caused now the Justice Department and the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, which is uh, the premier scientific organization for the last hundred years in the United States that sets weights and measures, um, to engage in a wholesale effort uh, to raise the scientific level of all these different forensic disciplines. So um, tell us a little bit about the process of co-writing your book, Actual Innocence, and what we've talked about today, like what's included in the book, and um, a little bit about that. All the causes of wrongful convictions that I mentioned to you mm -hmm. at the beginning of this interview, we divided up into chapters. And the way we did it is that we'd say, here's an eyewitness case, and we would tell a story. Uh, seen through the eyes of somebody that's wrongfully convicted in their family, and you get the story of the case, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. You see it from the perspective of the wrongfully convicted person. And, you know, narrative is so important. Storytelling is so important. That's the way you involve people and make them understand the issue. So each chapter was at least one story. Uh, and uh, uh, that had, we hope, dramatic appeal. And then by the end of the chapter, we said, this is a cause of wrongful conviction, this is the extent of the problem, and here are some of the reforms that can solve it, and here's who's working on it. And, and let me be the first to say that that innocence frame, dividing up all these causes, looking at the remedies, is useful uh, because it can focus people on specific reforms that can uh, prevent wrongful convictions. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps people focus legislatively and issue by issue. But I would be remiss if I didn't point out that it's inadequate to truly understand what's going on because in all of these cases, so many of these causes are going on at the same time. And they're all, uh, in some ways, uh, interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. And if you really want to get to the bottom of the problem and come up with real systematic changes 
that prevent these things from happening. You have to do essentially an all stakeholders review. You have to look at all the systems and figure out reforms that way. So the last question I want to ask you today is, um, you know, we're all college students and we're all kind of trying to find our passions and chase them to, you know, figure out what we want to do with the rest of our lives. So I want to ask, how did you find out that criminal, criminal injustice is something that you wanted to chase? Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the desire to change the world and to achieve social justice was always there, but I didn't uh, necessarily think I was going to be a lawyer at all. Uh, I thought that, uh, you know, I'd probably be making bad television in Hollywood or something, but I, I ran around uh, when I graduated Yale in 1971. Uh, uh, I had a half-inch video camera, and I applied for a Danforth scholarship uh, to make half-inch videotapes and put them on public access cable that was going to breach consciousness and you know, form a great political movement. <laughs> um, and there was a whole group of people that actually uh, were involved in this kind of thing. And uh, they all wound up in Hollywood uh, yeah. making movies and things of that nature. Not all of them bad. Um, but I was very interested in that, you know. And, uh, you know, let's face it, the work of the Innocence Project and uh, a lot of the cases that I've been involved in have involved the media. So, for example, one of my good friends in college was Steve Brill, the guy who invented Court TV, and he went to law school, but I think he'd be the first to tell you he never practiced law, he was a journalist. The key to all of this is that you just have to find something that gives you energy, that you think is uh, uh, the right kind of thing to do, that you think has, gives your life meaning and purpose, uh, and commit to it. And, you know, follow it wherever it takes you. Thank you so much for the advice, and thank you for being here today. It was a real pleasure listening to you. Well, really a pleasure to meet you, Julie, and thanks for the interview. Yep, no problem. All right. Thank you for watching this segment of the University Lecture Series with Barry Sheck.